welcome. Okay, so what I want to talk to about today is this idea of video games as a subversive art, right? As you can see by my beautiful slide that I put hours of work into. Um, and the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, what does subversive mean? So this is an excerpt from a book that I got um, called Film as a Subversive Art, and it explains exactly what subversive actually is. To be subversive is when you subvert existing norms, values, institutions, taboos um, by the most powerful art in the century. At the time they're talking about film, I'm talking about video games. I think that video games particularly are great at pushing people to view the world in a different way, to have different experiences, to stop thinking about the world in a very much more personal way because when we play a video game we're not just watching a protagonist a story isn't unfolding we are directly affecting the events within the game whether it's a third person narrative story whether it's a first person shooter whatever we are the ones who are affecting the world by our actions within a game and i think that that can fundamentally change the way we see the world so in this case like as i've said we become the protagonist in the game. So I think it's important for games to be subversive and to push people to think because of, such, because of the fundamental difference it can make in people's viewpoints. The next thing I want to talk about, okay, so I just have the slide up because it's the cover of the book and it's fucking cool. Um, so the big thing is, should we actually be subversive? Is it necessary? And I think that the answer is like overwhelmingly yes. Beyond the effect that you can have on people and how they view the world and how they view other people, it's also just we need to be consistently pushing the boundaries of the medium of video games because that's how, as an industry, we grow and we innovate and we learn and and we push what can be done and how we can view video games like VR is a great example of that where we are literally becoming more and more immersed in these video game worlds and a lot of the way we get to that kind of growth is by subvert subverting expectations and subverting norms within games. So what I want to do is I'm going to do a little bit of a case study on three games that have different kinds of subversion. The first one I'm going to talk about is Funnily enough, a first-person shooter, Spec Ops The Line from 2012. So what makes this game subversive? Because this is a very much a stylistically subversive game. That means it presented itself as your run-of-the-mill first-person shooter, like shoot em up 43 or Halo 29 million, the days of the grizzled white man shooting people. But what it does that I think is very important and something that we need more in games is that it goes, cool, you're a first person shooter in a fantastical land in Dubai where there's been these crazy sandstorms that have destroyed the city and you're going in to prevent the military aspect that is there from committing atrocities against you know, people in Dubai. So it's very much set up that you're the hero of the story going in to liberate and save these people. But the longer you play the game, the more that you realize that you're actually the bad person. It makes you realize the horrors of war. It makes you feel uncomfortable with the atrocities you have to commit, especially because you're not really clear about which side is the right side, which side is the good side. And the other thing that it does, which I think is like very important when you're looking at games that deal with war and military, is your, your character has PTSD. So you're hallucinating, you're seeing things, you're not reacting properly, you're trigger happy, and you yourself as the protagonist commit atrocities, right? This is a game that pushes us to question how we look at war, how we valorize war and violence. And I think like, that's a very important thing to have in a game. And it's not anything anybody expected because the rest of the spec ops um, games really are just your run of the mill first person shooter. And like, that's a really good kind of stylistic um, subversion that definitely helps making us think about the world and the way in which we interact. Um, I read a study that showed that obviously video games do not make us more violent, like playing vi violent video games doesn't make you violent, or playing games that have misogynistic 
elements don't make you a misogynist, but what they do is they change the way in which we see the world. Like as human beings, we are inherently affected by the media we consume, right? It doesn't have to be very overt where because one person does one thing, you do the other, but rather it's the way in which you view the world and the way in which you interact with the world changes. As people who play games or who are involved in game making, you know, the whole point is that you start off with the problem, you eliminate the problem with a certain amount of effort, and once that problem is eliminated, you move on to the next level. And this is something that you can apply directly to how we interact online. You are outraged about, I don't know, feminists speaking, or you're outraged about like women making games, or you're outraged that somebody said a sexist thing or a racist thing. So we bomb the problem with stories and think pieces, and we get the person fired, or we prevent them from speaking at an engagement, and then we feel like we've solved the problem and we move on to the next thing. I mean, do we even know if Flint, Michigan's water has been fixed? No, because it was a problem at the time, and we feel, because of the way we interact with games, that we've moved on to the next level and the next problem that's been sorted with our means of acting. So, I mean, like, that's why I think that it's very important to look at the way in which we interact in games, to look at the way in which we discuss how they affect us. Um, a more exciting and fun um, kind of subversion I'd like to talk about is like technical subversion. So if you haven't played this game that I'm about to talk about, I'm very sorry, I'm going to spoil it for you. I want to talk about the Doki Doki Literature Club. This game is like one of my favorite games that's come out in the last year. It is very much a anime dating simulator. So you're a character who goes into this book club with four beautiful women and you have to decide who you talk to and interact with the most and share poems with and read books with um, to decide who you're going to end up dating. So it very much is just a dating simulator. But the way in which it's subversive is fantastic because what it does is it re makes you realize that every choice you make has a devastating effect in the game. It goes from being this fun, quirky, silly dating simulator into a psychological horror where the more you play it, the more horrific things become, the more people's... Um, suppressed issues actually come out. So one of the characters, when you play it through, will hang themselves. And when that happens, the game immediately stops and restarts. And what makes it very technically subversive beyond being nothing like what it promised to be with these four beautiful anime women, is that it also forces you to engage with the fact that you're playing a game. So as you're playing the game, you have to go back in into the log files of the game and you have to like see in there there's additional information about what's happening in the story. You can watch as the game changes itself so fundamentally that once you get to the end of one playthrough, the game is gone and can no longer function because so much of the files have been deleted and removed. And what this game does really well, which I think is quite a useful tool, is that it also has a surprise, oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it also has like a surprisingly accurate description of depression. It shows us how interacting, how decisions we make can harm other people. But beyond that, how when someone is going through a severe depression, liking them and being there for them may not be enough. That like sometimes it is not up to you as someone's friend to help them, but to just be supportive. And that can be a terrifying experience on, your, on its own because you're not sure what's going to happen. And I really like that. I like that this game manages to have so many layers in terms of like how it subverts what we expect from you know these stock standard a little bit sexist um, dating simulator games which I really like um, and finally the last thing I want to talk about totally not because I work for them or they pay me I promise I promise it's because I care about the game is genital jousting so this is one of my favorite kinds of subversion because it is a fucking dick game. You are literally fucking other dicks. And so, you know, you expect it to be a silly party game. It's a multiplayer. You penetrate and are penetrated by some dicks with your friends and there are all kinds of challenges. And it's a lot of fun. And yet, underneath this dick game is an incredibly important discussion and thought process around toxic masculinity. So when you play the single player mode, which we won an award for, hooray, what you see then... 
<laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, what you see then is it deals with like how, particularly for men, you engage with the world. It's about a guy who's trying to find a date to a 10 year reunion. And every step he gets through, he goes through trying to find this partner, this date, is a lot of toxic masculinity. It's thinking about, oh, well, women will only like me if I have a fuck ton of stuff. So let me go to the shops and spend all my money and buy things. And when that doesn't work, it's not, you know, looking inside. It's the next thing that you perceive as of like, oh, it must be how I look. I should be big and powerful and very strong and have massive muscles. That will attract female. It also deals with like how you interact with other people in dance floors and like your manner. And it's still just a game about fucking dicks. And halfway through the game, you can go out of your way and put like fire hydrants up your ass and like play around. And I think like that's the kind of thing we need where even with our, you know, weirdest, most phallic games, we are managing to put in messages of things that we think are important. And I think it's great that none of these messages are like hitting you over the head saying, oh my God, we have a message. Our message is that, you know, toxic masculinity is bad or depression is hectic or every decision you make is wrong. It's very much something that the player can come to by themselves and think about and interact with by themselves, by being so deeply immersed in the game. And like that's kind of what I love about video games. I love the interactiveness. I love the fact that you need to think about what you're going to do. And I think the games that push you to really think about those choices when you're in a game are fantastic. I mean, we've all been that person in Skyrim who goes and like murders a town because you're looking for a special sword. But you know, you don't really think of those townspeople as people, so it's nice for there to be a little bit of a repercussion when you go on a killing spree. I'm not talking from experience, I totally did not kill a town for a sword. It was for a magic staff. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, like, that's the kind of thematic subversion that I like to talk about. Uh, oh no, I can't get this off. There we go. Okay, so now it's... Speaking about subversion, it's now time for me to get a little bit subversive myself, which is to ask the question, is the indie scene in and of itself subversive? And surprisingly, even with all these beautiful, amazing games that are being made within the indie scene, I don't think it's particularly subversive, and I'm gonna tell you why. In this sense, I wanna look at how our scene is made up, like, and one of the big things about subversion is you have to you know, go around the expectations, the norms of a society. And a problem within our indie scene is that we don't do that, right? Our indie scene is still overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly male, and overwhelmingly straight. So I think it's very important for us to understand that in this particular context, in these spaces, to create a more subversive scene, we have to be better about being inclusive for queer people, for women, for people of color, because being a person of color or being a woman or being queer in these spaces is inherently subversive. I am literally one of like four people of color at this entire festival of 5,000 people. And for me to be on the stage holding the space, doing this talk is subversive because it is unexpected because of the way our society perceives what game developers and indie developers are supposed to look like. So allowing more people who don't fit that norm to inhabit the space, to take up space, is vitally important. I mean, in the UK, of the indie developers, 14% are women, 4% are people of color, and something like 5% are queer. And particularly for an indie de uh, dev scene where we want to be pushing boundaries, we want to be making interesting games, we can be making incredibly niche games for incredibly niche audiences. This seems like the perfect industry for people who exist in the margins of our society to make games for other people who exist in those margins where you can see yourself in a game, you can see yourself on stage. It's why I choose to do these kinds of talks because I think it's good that we have more women, we have more queer people, we have more people of color on the stage holding these spaces and making the space, I don't want to say welcoming, but making the space more inclusive and, and saying to people that this is 
also your space. Because even the way we talk about these issues can be, I don't want to say problematic because that's such a cliche, but it can be difficult, right? Because we all have unconscious biases that affect how we perceive things. So for a long time, when I got, in, when I got into game development, people talked about making me feel welcome in the space as though they were the ones who could allow me into that space and make me feel welcome, as opposed to saying, you belong here, this space is your space, it doesn't belong to us. We can't decide if you're welcome in the space or not. You know, you know what I mean? And I think that's important. So even though I was talking about like fun, subversive things, I, th I decided that it would be subversive to push what I think is a very important issue that we need to be discussing and talking about ways to make the space more inclusive. So some of the ideas I have is simply making sure and going out of your way to have more people of color, to have more women, to have more people from developing countries at these kind of festivals and talking and pushing. It's doing things like Amaze has done, which I think is fantastic. Having a very clear zero policy, safe space policy that says if someone is mean, uh, not mean to you, sorry. If someone you know, is racist or sexist or homophobic against you, we will take action to make it very clear that these kinds of behaviors are not acceptable in the space. It's things like actively working against your inherent bias and understanding that, you know, because we all have it, that sometimes it doesn't matter what a person looks like, it matters what they can do. That if your culture within a company or within a scene is predominantly male, then as the people in the scene, you need, to be push of, you need to be pushing actively to change that. You need to be pushing actively to get more women involved, to get people of color involved wherever you can, to make it safe for queer people, to do things that push us as a scene out of our comfort zone. Because being subversive is important. Doing new things is important. Not only to make the world a better place, like I'm a bleeding heart liberal, that's always what I'm going to try and do but purely so that this industry can continue to thrive and grow and challenge the norms and challenge society, whatever side that is, whether it's challenging liberals or it's challenging, uh, the word's not Republicans, conservative is challenging conservative thinking. Whichever side you fall on, whichever side you want to, you know, push and question, that can only happen when you have multiple viewpoints, when you have people who experience and see the world in different ways, make interesting, different, strange games. And uh, thank you very much for listening to me. This is my talk. And I'm like 20, I'm like 20 seconds early in finishing. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> okay. So um, I got told that it's a question and answer session as well. So I talk for 20 minutes and there are five minutes of questions. So come at me. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody? <laughs> oh, hi. Thank you. Uh, for games, uh, I, I feel like uh, so much of what we do is validated through the success of money and that creates a, di uh, a different uh, narrative. So I was curious if you have any thoughts about yeah, subversion and money. I actually do. Um, I very nearly made a talk about subversion and money, but then I freaked out because it's very stressful. So I think when you talk about subversion and money, it becomes a question of what is your goal, right, when you're making an indie game? Because I think it is possible to make a game without spending a lot of money. It's hard and it takes time. But particularly with the way in which our industry works and how we're so hyper-focused on specific audiences when making games, that it is 100% possible to literally make a game about a penis, you guys, <laughs> and sell like a lot of copies and make money. But beyond that, I think one of the biggest problems is in terms of accessing funding from companies or from um, governments because I don't want to speak to how it is in Europe but 
in South Africa particularly, our government can be somewhat dysfunctional. And so the avenues where we can get funding either don't have the money or don't work correctly or legitimately do not understand how video games can be artistic and deserving of those funds. So that's a huge problem. And when I was thinking about it, I thought that one of the important things is for companies like publishing houses, like companies that create the, um, for example, HTC or Oculus, need to get into funding more projects for their platforms. I think that there's definitely a way in which like, a lot of the companies that make a huge amount of money of selling consoles can earn that money back or can get more people onto their platforms by releasing interesting games, by giving money to people who make strange games that push the platforms. An example of this, actually, is a game called Long Distance Caller that uh, Freelabs has been working on for the last year. It's not like other VR games. It's very artistic. It's based off the artwork of a fine artist. It's like a window into her world. It's this beautiful contemplative space in VR that's an experience but can't necessarily be classified as a game and you'd think that something like that would be beneficial for VR spaces to have because you're bringing in more people to that space, you're bringing in more people who want to experience that, who want to buy these kinds of consoles so that they can play these kinds of games and experience these kinds of things. So I definitely think that when you talk about subversion and money, it becomes a question of being able to convince people that it is important to fund these artworks, not just for making the world better, but because there is an active and massive benefit in getting more people onto your platform, in getting more people to buy um, your consoles, in getting more people involved in gaming, because you know, we're at a point now in 2018 when 90% of the world plays games. Anyone plays games and everyone plays games. And by not being willing to cater to everyone, we're just missing out on massive chunks of supporters and, and fans and consumers. So I think subversion and the economic issues go hand in hand. I hope that answered your question. Okay, cool. Does anybody else have any questions? Hello, hello. I, I don't know if it's a question, maybe just a comment. Sure. Because, um, I don't know, like you were talking about like the whole topic of video games. Yeah. Um, it's more like a Western idea, you know what I mean? Like it's more like a, like a modern society to be involved in front of a computer, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you were saying that 90% of the population playing games, but yeah. also like, I don't know, I come from South America mm. and there are plenty of communities that don't even have a computer also in, in Africa and in, you know what I mean? And the whole idea of subversive in the video game like the video game is very involved or very attached with this Western society, you know what I mean? I think I can, oh sorry. Continue. Okay, yeah, no, that's right. And then it's just that, that idea of the also like this, um, like offline video games, you know what I mean? Like all of these games that doesn't necessarily need a VR set or like the highest machine or like the most expensive, um, I don't know, tools to play. But it was just a comment that I was thinking. Cool, thank you so much for that comment. I think it like touches on a very important point. I mean, I wish my talk was longer because there's so much to talk about. But I mean, to speak to that, I think that mobile games are also video games. Like if you're playing a game on your phone that counts as a game, and I'm not sure about South America, but definitely in Africa, and particularly South Africa, the majority of people aren't on the internet via computers or have high-end game playing machines or consoles, they have phones. And even games that come on a little phone with a screen that don't take a lot of energy can be subversive. I think that like, especially when you look at Android phones, as much as I love Apple, um, Android phones are great for this because developers are literally making little games on their phones and using the APKs to send them around. So I think that when talking about subversion, when talking about getting people involved in games, we do also need to be welcoming of mobile games and how those can have a massive impact on people, particularly because that's how a lot of people in Africa particularly interact. I think that, you know, sure we can say that not everyone has access to video games, but that also makes it tricky because I think having online, offline games are amazing 
it kills me that we don't do that as much anymore because I hate people, so I don't want to be playing with people on a game. I just want to be by myself shooting lightning out of my hands. Um, but I think we also look, need to then look at a structural subversion in how we define what games are and how can we get more people involved in gaming and more people asking questions. And I definitely think that looking at a mobile platform, looking at how can we get cool, strange, little subversive games, you know, available on the app, on the Google Play Store or even the iPhone Store is a massively important part of that. I hope that answered the comment or responded to the comment. I don't know, you guys. Does anybody else have anything to ask? Oh, there we go. So, yeah, thank you. Hi. It's quite an important topic. Uh, and there we come to kind of a problem. I mean, this game about literally dicks is not kind of appealing to a big audience, I think. And you maybe not know exactly what this game is about and what like, it hides behind. These important questions of masculinity and stuff. But uh, just uh, from the first view, for like many players, I believe, it would not be that like appealing, as I said. It's just just as important to keep those games about important questions about subversion as well, to be accessible by a large audience as well, because otherwise uh, your message just wouldn't uh, get received properly. Sure, I think, I think that's a very good point, but I think it's also a question of like, are you aiming to affect a lot of people, or are you aiming to affect people who may have, have a different view? So what we noticed with genital jousting is a lot of the people who are playing the game weren't necessarily like liberal leaning people. It was a lot more people who are very much into the sort of toxic masculinity, very much into like that big bro culture who are playing this game because it's a funny joke, right? Not everyone's going to play it, but people are like, oh my God, it's a game about dicks, this is so funny. And so we were aiming for that kind of audience to make them think more about perceptions and how they see the world. So sometimes I don't think it's important to reach a massive audience. I think sometimes even being able to change the mind of 10,000 people is a very big thing. And surprisingly, you guys, this game sold like 200,000 copies. So <laughs> I know, right? That was also my response <laughs> when we found out. So I think when you're also thinking about subversion, it's also we need to subvert that expectation that we do need to sell to like 100,000 people or 50,000 people. Sometimes affecting 10,000 people is enough as long as four out of that 10,000 are inspired and want to create their own thing and it makes them view the world differently, which weirdly enough can affect more and more people. I think that's good too. So I think also the expectation of mass appeal can be very useful and especially when you're trying to sneak in a message about whatever you want to talk about. It's great to have that mass appeal but it's also awesome to affect 10,000 people. I mean, some of the most uh, influential movies in the 21st century have only been watched by a handful of people. You know, we all say we've seen 2001 A Space Odyssey and at least 90% of us are lying. Um, but that movie had a massive impact on the cinematic industry and the world in terms of how people made movies and perceived the art and used angles and all sorts of things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed that. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to go now. <laughs> Bye.